Lakeland Public Television, the Bemidji Pioneer, the Brainerd Dispatch, and KAXE Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2014 a look at our area legislative candidates. And now, the State House of Representatives District 10A debate. Your moderator tonight is Ray Gildow. Good evening, and welcome to our sixth and final debate on Lakeland Public Television as we move into the election year of 2014. We're coming to you this evening live from our Brainerd studio, and uh, for the next hour, we will be interviewing our two candidates for the Legislative District 10A, John Ward, who is the incumbent, and Josh Heinzman, who is the Republican challenger. Welcome, gentlemen. It's good to have you both here. I'd like to introduce our panel this evening. The panel will be asking questions, some of which will be their own, and some may be uh, questions that have been sent to them through emails uh, or other ways. And uh, I'd like to introduce, first of all, uh, Mike O'Rourke, who is a Brainerd Dispatch Associate Editor. Uh, next to him is Dennis Wyman, who is the News Director for Lakeland Public Television. And Heidi Holton, who is the Program Director for Northern Community Radio, KAXE in Grand Rapids, and KBXE in Bemidji. I'd like to start out by just uh, reviewing the rules so that everybody is on the same page on how we're going to operate this this evening. The candidates will rotate the order that they are speaking, beginning with opening comments and finishing with closing comments. The rotation will stay the same all the way through the program. Each candidate gets two minutes to answer the question, and each candidate will have a one-minute rebuttal opportunity. Questions continue until we are about at the 50-minute mark, where each candidate will then be given uh, two minutes for closing comments. Um, I'd like to start, I guess, this evening with uh, Mr. O'Rourke, if you would have the first question. Or, I'm sorry, first of all, we have opening comments. did that last night, too. Uh, let's start out with uh, Mr. Heinzman with opening comments, please. Sir, I, uh, I want to thank Lakeland Public Television, our panel, and all those taking time to watch tonight's debate. I'm very excited to be here talking about the challenges facing Minnesota and what I believe to be my qualifications to help get us back on track. My name is Josh Heisman. I've lived in the area all my life. I've been married to my amazing wife, Carrie, for 15 years. We have five wonderful children ranging in ages from 17 months to 13 years. I graduated with a degree in business management from Central Lakes College, and I went right to work in my family's log accent business uh, in the con construction. Through, years, through the years, I've worked with local boards, church groups, and I currently serve as a manager in the 30 Lakes Watershed District. These experiences, along with the relationships that I've built with business and community leaders, give me a wide base of resources to draw on and to refer to when representing our district's businesses in St. Paul. I, rep I respect Representative Ward, but I'm very concerned with the direction his votes have taken Minnesota. Tonight, I'm offering the people of this district a change of course and a chance to restore balance to our legislature. Thank you. Mr. Ward. Well, I'd like to thank uh, everyone that is involved in putting this debate together tonight as well. Um, just a little bit about myself. My name is John Ward. I have been your state representative from District 10A and prior to that, District 12A for the last eight years. I'm married to my best friend, Sally. Uh, her and I have been married for 40 years. Um, I got the best end of that deal, no question about it. Um, Sal and I, I have four children, and we just had our ninth grandchild. Um, I was an educator and a coach for uh, over 33 years and had a remarkable teaching and coaching career um, and, and thankful for that opportunity. Sal and I and our kids all are engaged in our community in our profession, and in our church. We always have been. We always believe in volunteerism and giving back and paying it forward. I thank the voters of 10A for allowing me the opportunity to hold this position and job, the opportunity to serve and represent you, the opportunity to be your public servant. Now, there are many different aspects of this job, uh, and tonight, in my opening remarks, I want to focus on what I feel is the most important part of this job. I, the most important part of this job, in my opinion, is to, when I hear from you, my constituents, um, 
to respond to you as quick as I can based on the needs and the problems and concerns that you tell me you have. Daily, I hear from my constituents that have problems and concerns and questions, and they often tell me, Representative Ward, you are our last bit of hope. You are our last bit of ability to make sure that this problem is taken care of. You know, um, that to me is the most important part of this job, is replying as quickly as we can and doing what we can to help the constituents that we serve, to truly be a public servant. Many of the people that get hold of me have heart-wrenching stories, and I just want to share a couple with you. I'm thinking of a military veteran, homeless veteran in southern United States, a woman with a child that was trying to get back home for Christmas in order to get her life back together. I helped her. I'm thinking of a mother, 34-year-old mother, children, with two children and a husband, in her manufactured home east of Brainerd, that was dying of cancer. She was in hospice at home. Her propane ran out, and the company would not fill it because they owed, they owed money. I helped her get her propane filled, and a few days later, she died in peace with her family. And then I think of the Lyme disease victims. A few years ago, that came to me, the chronic Lyme disease victims that had chronic, chronic uh, disease that they were not receiving their treatment for. I helped them. That, to me, is the most important part of this job and the one that I treasure the most. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Okay, our first question will come from Mr. O'Rourke, and it will be directed, first of all, towards Mr. Ward. Thank you, Ray. <clears throat> ATVs are a popular form of recreation in your district, uh, although they can sometimes cause problems. Should landowners be compensated by the state for damage caused by ATVs, which are legally operating their vehicles in ditches that run in front of their houses? Thank you for the question, Mike. This has been an issue, uh, an ongoing issue for many, many, many years. And uh, it also has come to the legislature as an issue that we have dealt with. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, and it reminds me of uh, when I was younger, uh, when snowmobiles first came out, and the same issue came up with snowmobiles. Uh, they were um, uh, having destructive nature uh, on people's property, and people were opposed to them. Um, and, um, you know, didn't want them uh, on their property and destroying their property, obviously. So what we did was we got all the stakeholders together years ago and worked together to come up with um, a plan that would allow snowmobilers their uh, trails and their, uh, their riding uh, ability to uh, make sure that uh, they did it in a safe, respectful manner. Same thing here. We need to have people working together in a collaborative effort. Uh, we've developed some ATV trails in the state. Um, and, you know, as people um, destroy other people's personal property, um, that is uh, ob obviously not acceptable. Um, and so, you know, um, as far as re recovering damages from the state of Minnesota, um, I know that that's been um, a part of a, a proposal in the past. I think it's something that we can look at. Uh, but I, I would rather see people work together collaboratively to make sure that the, the property owners' um, re rights are respected and the ATV folks have what they need in order to um, have their opportunities met as well. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Mr. Heinzman. Yeah, I have, uh, I have a distinct uh, uh, ad, uh, blessing in this situation to have enjoyed ATV riding across the state and, and utilizing the ditch system as part of the trail system. And uh, there have been at times, I've seen places where there have been problems on road approaches. And uh, the ATV clubs have, have uh, worked with a number of, of those landowners to try and resolve those issues. And uh, I like what they have done with their trail ambassador program. And I think that the state should continue to work with ATV clubs to go through that process and try to uh, fix the damage done uh, in the process of enjoying uh, that sport. Thank you. Um, any rebuttal, Mr. Ward? Well, not necessarily a rebuttal, but just uh, I, I own an ATV. I ride it. I, uh, um, I respect my, prop, my neighbor's property. Um, I've been on ATV uh, rides uh, as a legislator. And um, as, as uh, Josh has said, 
Uh, the ATV Ambassador Program really has done a lot uh, in trying to work together, as I mentioned before, collaboratively so that ATV owners and property owners all have uh, their rights and, and needs met. Thank you. Any follow-up on that, Mr. Heinzman? No. Okay. We'll move on to question number two from Mr. Wyman. Thank you very much, Ray, and thank both of you for joining us tonight. Our lakes and rivers are vitally important in this part of the state and certainly in your district. Recently, uh, zebra mussels were confirmed as far north as Cass Lake, which I know is outside your district, but in your district, Gull Lake has had has AIS issues. And as a state legislature, there have been attempts to address this. What I'd like to know is your assessment of how you feel we're doing at addressing this very difficult challenge of, of stopping this spread, and if there's anything more that can be done. Mr. Ward, I believe you're first. Or I'm sorry, Mr. Heisman, you have the first shot at that question. Yeah, that's okay. <clears throat> uh, I currently serve as a manager on our watershed district here in Crow Wing County. Uh, it's a small watershed district. It only represents 7% of Crow Wing County, but we've done a lot of really neat work in the area since we were put together. I think we were founded in 1972. Uh, recently, AIS has been a huge issue across the state. There's been numerous groups and organizations that have come to our watershed district and said, uh, you know, what can we do? What are, what's new and what's happening in Minnesota? Back in January, I attended the Minnesota Association of Watershed Districts annual meeting. And we learned uh, a lot about what's happening, a lot of the, the new tools that are, that are available. Uh, I think what's the most disturbing part of all of this is it's, it's really come down to a matter of education in a lot of cases. Boaters are being educated, and uh, those who use our lakes and streams and rivers are, are learning what, it, what we can do to prevent the spread of AIS. Unfortunately, it, it does continue to spread. And uh, what we're looking at uh, at the watershed district level um, have been how do we uh, how do we repair some of that damage? So some ideas that have come forward in, in the last few months and last year maybe has been uh, lake restorations uh, in cases where maybe the narrow lift cattail has uh, dumped and loaded a lake with a lot of material and you see that lake becoming more shallow every year. You might even be losing fish habitat. Um, I think that there's some great opportunities to look towards the future and to try to find ways to restore that fish habitat and restore that recreational value. Thank you. Mr. Ward. Well, as, as my opponent said, uh, AIS has become a um, very, very critical issue for the whole state of Minnesota. You know, um, this goes back to our partnering with our federal government folks as well and the, fe and the waters of, uh, of, of federal waters. Um, the, you know, the, the, federal, the federal government allowed... Uh, the, sh the ships up in the Great Lakes to empty their ballast when they were coming into the Great Lakes. And that was part of the problem that initially started the whole AIS problem. Um, and now we have carp that are trying to get up the uh, St. Anthony Lock and Dams, and, you know, we're addressing that with our federal, federal partners as well. Um, I've been, since I've been in the legislature, I have been a champion in fighting aquatic invasive species. Uh, it, in our area, our, our, wa our watershed, our lakes, our rivers, our natural resource, our beautiful, beautiful water uh, needs to be protected. And, and the AIS, uh, aquatic invasive species and other invasive species, uh, have the potential to uh, threaten and damage severely um, our, our waters. So I've been a champion on this. I have, I have uh, sponsored legislation uh, to uh, educate, uh, to uh, increase enforcement, to increase penalties. Um, you know, it, it, when, you, when you go out and hunt and you poach and you're caught, you're, you have everything taken away from your license, your gun, your vehicle, everything. You know, if you, uh, if you uh, are caught uh, emptying uh, uh, AIS into a, into a lake, you get a $50 fine. That's nothing. And so, you know, we, we have tried to increase our, we've increased our penalties. I was the chief author of that. But the most important thing that we've done in the last couple of years is we've, um, we've, uh, invested in um, getting competitive grants to lake associations that are helping us with this fight. And more importantly, we set up Aquatic Invasive Research Center at the University of Minnesota. And we have put research and development monies towards that research development center. And you know that, that's where the solution to this is gonna come from, science. And so the research and development monies are critically important in the fight of this, and I've been a champion in leading that. Mr. Heinzman, any follow-up to that? 
Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Um, <clears throat> most of us can think of a lake, maybe a shallow lake, maybe a bay, where uh, we have seen a lot of material, like I had mentioned earlier, come into that basin and fill that up, and maybe the crappies can't spawn there the way they, they used to. And as we've been working with uh, local agencies and, and state agencies to try and restore, like I had mentioned earlier, that value, that recreational value back to that body of water, there have been obstacles. Uh, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources has, has worked hard to restore, because maybe they have fewer lakes, maybe they, maybe they look at it a little bit different than we do, but a proactive approach after we've had a problem, after we've seen um, a lake deteriorate, and look at, the, look at the opportunities to restore that, I think is a great, uh, a great opportunity that it hasn't been utilized yet by Minnesota. So going towards, in the future, I'd love to see some changes legislatively to allow other watershed districts or counties to maybe have that opportunity. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ward, any follow-up on that? Just the fact I wanted to, again, emphasize the appreciation and uh, work efforts of the lake associations, local lake associations. Many of, the, many of them have their volunteers at the landings. Some of them have bought decontam units, which are critical in the fight of this, uh, stopping the spread of aquatic invasive species. And by the way, there are folks uh, in the legislature and citizens in the state of Minnesota that say, you know, this isn't, we're just throwing money away. I don't believe that. I don't, I don't buy that. We have to fight this thing with everything that we can to stop the spread as best as we can to let science, research, and development uh, come up with a solution uh, to all aquatic invasive species uh, spread and, and preventing them, the, the spread of them and stopping that. All right. Thank you. We'll move on to question number three from Ms. Holton, and it will be directed to uh, Mr. Ward first. Thanks, Ray. Minnesota has been successful in job creation, but most of them have been very low paid. What could the state do to create higher paid jobs? Well, this job creation and retention was a critical priority for us in the state this, this past session. I happened to sit on the Job and Economic Development Committee. It was a great committee uh, that I learned a lot on. It's the first time I sat on it. And we... Uh, we on the jobs committee um, passed significant uh, job bills both years uh, in th 2013 and 2014. Um, we took a, the, the previous administration, the last, uh, the, when the Republicans were in control, they cut jobs significantly. Uh, they cut jobs and economic development significantly. And um, thus we had a downturn in, in the jobs. Um, since, uh, since uh, Governor Dayton has taken over uh, the governorship in two, when, when he was elected, uh, 172,000 jobs have now been created. Our unemployment is the lowest it has ever been, 4.1%, lowest it's been in the last eight years. The jobs that we created uh, in the jobs committee were good, are good paying jobs. Uh, Minnesota Investment Fund, Job Creation Fund, uh, three new trade offices uh, that our Minnesota exports can now be sending their products to. Um, locally, I sponsored a bill that was a job training bill for manufacturers that would, that would uh, re reimburse them for the training that they receive for hiring a new employee. Uh, so, you know, the jobs are there, the good paying jobs are there. We need to also match up uh, closing the skill gap uh, of the employers. Uh, they say that they have, they can't even hire enough people to, to, to fill the jobs that they have. So that bill that I was the chief author of uh, last year, um, you know, would, would do that. I also uh, passed a bill with, with, which was the uh, Economic uh, Growth Acceleration Program that allowed businesses to expand. So when we allow that ha to happen, good jobs, good paying jobs do happen. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Mr. Heinzman. <clears throat> yeah, as a, uh, as a small businessman, as a, as a business that works with other large companies um, and as a, just a person that's concerned about uh, the, the, the jobs of, of Minnesotans. Uh, I'm seeing kind of a pattern across Minnesota over the last few years. You have locally Trust Joyce McMillan that moved out of the area. You have uh, Potlatch that's doing very little uh, in, the, in the lakes area anymore. And then, of course, uh, bigger companies across the state. Medtronic has, has reorganized outside uh, of the U.S. and the companies like uh, Uline have just moved across the river just a few miles to uh, to find a more um, 
a more uh, conducive government or conducive government or uh, tax structure. And uh, I'm seeing a situation where Minnesota has a huge opportunity to bring these jobs back to Minnesota, to bring these businesses back to Minnesota. And even, uh, even in other states, you see things, uh, for example, in, in New York, they have a tax-free zone, and I'm not going to, uh, the details there are, are interesting, and I'm not going to go into all those things, but uh, for 10 years, in some cases, you're not going to be paying uh, some state taxes. That allows businesses to grow, to build, to get to a point where they can hold on and, and to pay uh, good or to provide good paying jobs. And I'm looking forward to an opportunity to, maybe, to have a say in that, to be able to uh, uh, create a strong atmosphere for, for those businesses and be able to help those businesses across the state. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Heinzman. Mr. Ward. You know, I also want to talk about, uh, I sit on a small business caucus down at the state legislature, and the small business caucus looks at ways to improve small businesses in the state of Minnesota which we know the small businesses are the economic driver for many local uh, communities, uh, smaller communities and gr in greater Minnesota. Um, we, this year in the state, provided the largest tax cut in the history of the state when we, uh, when we uh, did a tax cut on unemployment insurance tax, uh, $364 million, which allowed businesses then to hire more people. Um, you know, Minnesota is reported uh, almost weekly lately as a top top business uh, business economic growth job growth uh, best place to do business by political by Forbes by a number of research agencies around the country and so we are leading our Midwestern states uh, with the exception of North Dakota because of the oil but we are in place to um, again have significant job creation with good living wage jobs for our constituents Thank you, Mr. Ward. Mr. Heinzman. Yeah, you know, I really became, became interested in this race uh, in 2013. After uh, my business, 2012, we were having a really good year. We saw a lot of things happening. I saw we had, we had one of the best, actually, years that we'd had in a long time in 2012. Um, and I'm thinking, hey, it's over. I'm starting to see a real uh, uptick in Minnesota's economy along uh, with other businesses in the area. So I'm excited. And then in 2013, uh, I have orders being canceled, and I'm thinking, what, what's happening? So in the spring of 2013, I'm looking at the economy and looking at Minnesota's government, and I see that we're, we're raising taxes by $2.1 billion across the state. And that may not have had a direct impact on me personally, but it did on the people that I work for. And lots of other folks have experienced the same thing, where you're wondering, does Minnesota get it? Does the legislature understand? Does St. Paul understand? that when you raise taxes on those folks, they quit spending money the way that they had in the past, and it hurts small businesses like mine. Thank you. We now move to question number four, Mr. O'Rourke, and the uh, first question will be, that question will be directed first to Mr. Heinzman. <clears throat> Should Minnesota institute capital punishment? I think that uh, this is a case where uh, People are looking for a deterrent, and there's lots of, uh, lots of uh, opinions on whether or not this has a significant impact on, on uh, crime. If it is a real deterrent, personally, I believe that it could very well could be, and I would be interested in a discussion on how uh, that might impact crime and how it might possibly work uh, to help prevent more victims. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Well, that's a very interesting question, Mike, um, and thank you for that. Uh, you know, I guess um, as a deterrent to crime, um, I don't know that that has been proven or shown to be effective. I do know this. I'm a pro-life legislator. I'm a pro-life Democrat. And uh, when I say I'm pro-life, I mean that I'm, I, I'm proud of being a pro-life and Democrat, and I have a consistent pro-life voting record over the last eight years. And being pro-life to me is, is about abortion, but it is also about having a consistent ethic of life. It's about taking care of our poor. It's about taking care of our children. It's about taking care of our most vulnerable. And it's about uh, uh, not allowing capital punishment. And so, you know, when you have a consistent ethic of life and you say that you're pro-life, um, I really do mean that I'm pro-life. And so um, I don't know that uh, uh, capital punishment um, uh, would be a good deterrent um, I, you know, maybe we need to have a more um, heavier discussion on that. 
uh, statewide, obviously, um, and look at, uh, you know, if, if that is even uh, a possibility. But um, to me, in my, uh, in my consistent ethic of life kind of uh, theory and practice, um, I, don't, uh, I don't agree that the capital punishment, uh, you know, would, would, would fit my uh, theme of life. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Mr. Heisman? Yeah, I, I believe in protecting innocence. I believe that if the statistic could show that this is a deterrent to preventing more victims of violent crime, then it should be something that's considered. Okay. Thank you. Question number five will come from uh, Mr. Wyman. Or did I give you a chance to respond to that? No, you didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll, I'll pass. You sure? Yeah, I'll, I'll let you off the hook. All right. All right, question number five will come from Mr. Wyman, and uh, Mr. Ward, you will have the first shot at that. Riding in, in my vehicle today, I heard uh, attack ads on both of you guys, uh, two of them, uh, for each of you, like within 30 minutes. I, I know these aren't coming from your campaigns directed at, the next ca at, at each other's campaigns, but obviously they're targeted, so, you know, so one of, each of you would, would stand uh, to have a better chance at winning. My question is, is there a place for this? Are these successful? And I guess your overall opinion of these attack ads that are getting more and more prevalent every year. And I'm starting. You're starting. Thank you. Um, you know, thank you, Dennis, for that question. And, and actually, it's a question that just two nights ago my opponent and I talked about and uh, had a good discussion about. And, um, you know, here's part of the problem, uh, in my opinion, is that some research, and I don't even know where this research is coming from, shows that negative campaigning works. Um, and um, that is sad. That is absolutely sad, in my opinion. Um, you know, um, when I'm on the doors, when I'm listening to people and, he and hearing from people, um, they are fed up with negative ads. They are fed up with negative campaigning. They are fed up... I get, an, I get a, a piece of mail, and it isn't from my opponent. It's from an independent expenditure, just like you said. And we, my opponent and myself, don't even know what is being said in those because we can't by law. And, um, but it's, they're all filled with uh, misinformation, uh, trying to uh, slander uh, with lies, um, you know, and it is so frustrating. It is so frustrating that, you know, we as candidates try to give our message out of what we can and want to do and, and are willing to do, just like I showed for the last eight years. But yet somebody goes in and, um, you know, takes an eight-year voting record and, and um, distorts it and, and, and lies about it. And, you know, um, so we need campaign reform big time with financing, with uh, respect, with... Um, uh, political uh, uh, respect and, and uh, appreciation. Uh, Go Governor Arnie Carlson was just here, and I'm going to talk about him a little bit later. But one of the things that he said is, shame on us for allowing our public servants to be uh, criticized so frequently. In a business, a CEO would never come in daily and say, you know what, I've got the worst company and the worst employees in the world. They wouldn't do that. That's ridiculous. So let's have some respect uh, in the campaign process. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Mr. Heinzman. Yeah, John, I think really covered that. Uh, I did talk to a woman here not too long ago about our campaign, and she said, well, I just got a piece from you the other day. And I said, well, the truth is, as of the Thursday this week, I hadn't sent anything out yet. I hadn't sent out one lit piece or put one ad on the radio. So uh, it's difficult for the voters to see what is from the candidate. And Maybe they don't notice that little disclaimer on the bottom. Uh, you know, and a lot of times the print is so small, how could they? It's tiny. And there might need to be some changes that come uh, in the form of voter reform. Um, the idea probably was to um, stop that collusion between can candidates and outside groups. And uh, supposedly money was taken out of, uh, of uh, campaigning. But unfortunately, there has been some side effects to that issue. And maybe if there was some accountability, maybe if a candidate could be connected to those ads on some level, where if they had an opportunity to view those things, maybe that would be better. But honestly, I haven't seen anything personally that would uh, make me feel that I, I've become an expert on this. I've only 
uh, had a, had a uh, six-month window here to look and see how things work and understand the, the process better. Thank you. Mr. Ward? Well, my point makes a, an interesting comment because it has gotten in my, this, I'm, this is my fifth time running for office, and each year it has gotten worse. Each and every year it has gotten worse. And, you know, when are we going to stop? When are we going to become civil and respectful and appreciative of each other's service? I so much, I said it in, in my, our debate the other night, I so much appreciate anybody that's willing to serve and anybody that's willing to put their name on the line. And I said to Josh, I appreciate and respect the fact that you put your name on the line. And I mean that. And so, you know, big dollars are unfortunately in campaigns. And, you know, it's sad, in my opinion, to think that big dollars are what makes the difference in campaigns. Um, I know over in some European companies, they say, okay, here's, some, here's X amount of dollars. You got 10 days, campaign, done. You know, and maybe that's what we need to look at is um, some type. We de definitely need to look at camp campaign reform, uh, in my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Heinzman, any, any follow-up there? Sure. Yeah, I would actually encourage people, if you want to mm -hmm. know where a candidate's dollars personally are coming from, that information is available. You can search that, and you can see exactly who is contributing to, say, any individual campaign across the state. You, you can see exactly who those folks are that support a candidate, and that could give you a better picture of uh, their motivations in the future. Thank you. Our next question, question number six, comes from Ms. Holton, and it will be directed first to Mr. Heinzman. We've been hearing a lot about oil transportation. My question is about current and future pipelines. Um, they can't carry all the crude oil across northern Minnesota through those pipelines, and public officials and first responders are very nervous about the possibility of accidents. What do you think is the state's responsibility along those rail routes? I think this is a huge question, and this is something that is pressing right now in Minnesota. There is quite a debate right now about a pipeline, Enbridge, and the uh, Sam Piper pipeline. Um, in Minnesota, we have a situation now where it's impacting not just uh, oil industry or uh, other industry. It's even impacting our farmers. Our farmers right now in Minnesota are getting approximately $1 less per bushel uh, for their crops coming in because there's no trains to carry to uh, carry their uh, their crop coming in. Um, we see oil cars by the thousands going by, and we're wondering, hey, this is this really is a safety issue. This is something that we have to consider, and we have to move on in short order. There's been a lot of talk. Well, what route should this particular pipeline take? And frankly. Uh, it looks as though if we continue to push this issue down the tracks, that could very well kill this project and make it more difficult for Minnesotans in the future. It could make it more difficult for them to uh, uh, get their crops, like I mentioned a moment ago. And then also, we're going to see higher fuel costs as a result of this. Last winter, we have a pipeline that is no longer uh, being leased and allowed to uh, be utilized for propane. Propane, propane costs skyrocket. And uh, we need to be able to move oil through this area. And I understand there's environmental concerns, and I, under, I appreciate that. But we are, we are in a great position to move that oil safely. And statistically, it is much safer than by rail. And the leaks are, occur fewer, fewer times statistically, and there's fewer accidents when compared to uh, moving or transporting oil, oil by rail car. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Well, hey, thank you for that question. And actually, um, I come from a railroad town. I come from Proctor, Minnesota, and, I, and we live here in a railroad town. And so rail is very, very critical and important in the, in the transportation world for all commodities. And as was mentioned, uh, there are problems with commodities now um, not being able to access our rail. Um, and there are some safety issues with that uh, going through different uh, towns and locales. And so... Um, you know, the pipeline itself um, has a pro we've got a process. We've got a process to, you know, to, to go through to make, to make sure that the pipeline is done well. I think it was said recently, we've got to make sure we measure twice and cut once. And that's exactly what we need to do here. Because we talked a little bit ago about AIS and protecting our natural resource. And one of our most important natural resources for us in this northern area are water. 
our water. And this pipeline goes through, touches base uh, on the side of, right through much of our water resources in the, in, uh, the area. It's 616 miles long. And, um, and you know, I remember, he- and I've attended some meetings on this, and I remember hearing that there was a spill in Canada, a line that broke in a spill in Canada. It took them 14 hours to get to on a six-inch line and had thousands and thousands of gallons dumped by the time they got to it. This is a 30-inch line in places, and some places a 24-inch line. And can you imagine the devastation to our environment if there's a, a, a breakdown and we can't get to it? I mean, we have to make sure the MPCA, PUC, DNR have all suggested alternative routes. So we need to make sure the process is moving and working and that it is done right in order to protect our environment so that we give this environment to our next generation more beautiful than we were able to get it. Thank you. Mr. Heinzman. I agree. I agree that we need to look at the process. We need to look at the science and make the best decision possible. What I'm concerned about is that we're not considering the dangers that we are uh, watching pass us by every day. Uh, Yeah, a 30-inch pipe, that's a big tube. And a 6-inch pipe caused a lot of damage. I understand that. What I'm concerned about is what what could potentially be the economic impact and the environmental impact of one derailment. One derailment could have an enormous impact um, on, our, on, on our local towns. Um, some folks were sitting with uh, some others. We were, I, was, I overheard a conversation. We were thinking, well, what would protect the high school in Brainerd? And somebody said the river. And I was like, I don't think that's the solution. Thank you. Mr. Ward. Well, it just seems to me that when we do have uh, uh, breakdowns in fossil fuel, uh, whether it be in the Gulf of Mexico or other places, that it is a costly and long time fix before, and sometimes it never does come back to uh, the, the nature that it was prior to the breakdown. And so, again, we've got a process in place. Let the process work. I do understand the public safety concerns with the trains, with the rail. Um, again, I come from a railroad town. My family still is in the railroad business. And... You know, we we need to make sure that the, the, the rail line also has the safety measures um, uh, intact that allow uh, for for the the, the, the uh, cars to move through too. So again, it's it's a process that is being taken place, and um, let's let the experts uh, do their job. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mr. O'Rourke, and it will be directed to Mr. Ward first. We often talk about modeling good behavior. Give us an example of a state program that works very well and one that should be emulated. Well, um, I don't know if you mean should the people watch the legislature in action or not. So, uh, (laughs) um, you know, um, let me just say this. We have several programs. Uh, Number one, um, um, I think that individuals themselves are, you know, uh, called to make sure that we, we as individuals, uh, model good behavior, that we um, are positive in our comments, that we are positive in our actions, that we, uh, um, you know, are honest and truthful. Um, I think that's where it starts. Um, You know, I look at um, what we do for education down at the state of Minnesota. And I think that in itself uh, is a, uh, for the, over the last two years, what we've done over the last two years is a good role model uh, for, uh, for uh, modeling good behavior. Um, I'm thinking of a program that we have uh, down at the state capitol in the House. The Senate doesn't have it, of course, but the House does. Um, and it's called the PAGE program. And the PAGE program is a high school program for high school juniors. And it, and it allows a junior in high school to come down to the capitol one week at a time, and experience the life of the legislature. They go to committees. They they help a legislator. They work on the House floor. They are involved in the bill process. They do everything down at the Capitol that we as legislators do. 
Now, many of these students are, are young, young adults, young males and young females that are interested in the legislative process, maybe have a, a, want to be a lawyer or go into political science or something on that nature. But some of them are just general students who want to see how their government works. And I think it's a great opportunity for all children in the state of Minnesota. As a matter of fact, that program, uh, we, we close it out early because we get so many. So the, the, the PAGE program at the Capitol would be a program that I think models very, very good behavior. Thank you. Mr. Heintzman. Yeah, there's a program that is near and dear to my heart because it's something that was a really important part of uh, my education, and that was the post-secondary enrollment program. Uh, as a junior, I was able to start attending uh, college classes at Central Lakes, Central Lakes College and uh, was able to graduate and move towards uh, earning my degree. Uh, this, is, this is something that is a... Uh, terrific opportunity for kids that maybe they want to have a jump on on uh, their studies they want to be able to get through the college process quicker maybe they just want to save some money and uh, I think this is a terrific way to utilize uh, the state's resources and opportunities in education. Uh, Mr. Ward any follow-up on that? No. Okay Mr. Heinzman any follow-up from you? Okay. We'll move on to the next question. We'll come from Mr. Wyman and we'll be directed towards Mr. Heinzman. It seems every legislative session there's a renewed effort to legalize Sunday off-sale liquor. The state already allows liquor sales in bars and restaurants on Sundays. This would allow someone to buy beer or liquor from a liquor store on Sundays like many other states allow. Public opinion polls show the majority of Minnesotans want this, but still it is voted down year after year at the state legislature. My question is in two parts. Is it fair for the state to restrict a legal business from doing business on Sundays? And two, would you vote to legalize Sunday sales, yes or no, and why? This is an interesting question. As a lot of folks know, a local legislature has just, legislator has just opened a uh, brewery in, uh, in this district. And uh, there was some talk about, well, what, how is this issue uh, potentially going to move forward in the legislature? And... Um, I, what I'm realizing is that it's a more complex issue than I thought. And the distribution system was established a long time ago in the, the, the process of, of making uh, the beverage and then uh, sending the beverage to a, a warehouse, a, distribu a distributor, to then be sent to local um, bottle shops. And uh, the concern that I would have with changing the current system is that impact that it would have on local mom and pop stores, stores where they would have to have staff there that they wouldn't otherwise have on a Sunday. And maybe the bigger box stores wouldn't be impacted in a negative way by, by this change, but uh, considering that over 60% of, of that business is done through mom and pops, uh, I, I have a concern that that could hurt their businesses. And if the current model is working, um, there's a part of me that is, is, is sympathetic to their concerns and to their businesses. Thank you. Mr. Ward. I'm going to take just a little bit to tell you a little story about my first year down there and a Sunday blue moon law. I was contacted uh, once I was first elected uh, and an excited, energized, and wanting to go down and make a difference on the world of, uh, you know, for everybody. And so somebody got hold of me uh, from a recreational vehicle sales uh, operation and said that they wanted to uh, change because they were not allowed to sell recreational vehicles on Sundays, like automobile dealers are not allowed to be open on Sundays as well, and, and asked me if I would sponsor legislation to ha allow them to be open. And I said, are you sure, you know, do you have a consensus here of everybody that's wanting that legislation, you know, auto dealers and RV dealers? Oh, yes, 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 yes. So I introduced the bill. And within two seconds of the bill being introduced, I had every lobbyist in my office that, uh, uh, from the RV people, from the auto, from the auto dealers saying, what are you doing? We do not want to be open on Sunday. I said, well, my, I don't care what you're, so, you know, um, be careful what you wish for, for one thing. Um, but, you know, a lot of this comes from border kind of, uh, places like Duluth, Superior, um, Iowa, you know, it's, so the, the request oftentimes is a, is a border kind of request. I have heard from my constituents, as I have served down there the last eight years in my district, that they are not in support of a Sunday liquor sales. So that is what has impacted my vote, is what my constituents have told me. Um, even if I 
you know, even if my conscience said, I think it's an okay thing. My constituents he weighed heavily in on that. Um, I would not be opposed to, in my opinion, not be opposed to having a continued dialogue on this, uh, specifically about uh, border towns, border towns in the state of Minnesota who are impacted. And, and Josh is right. The, the, the extra financial burden it places on small shops, whether it be a muni-owned shop or a mom-and-pa shop, uh, you know, they're just taking on extra expenses, perhaps, because now they feel they have to be open to do the sale. So, uh, you know, we have to have further discussion and dialogue on it. All right, thank you. I, I've got a little follow-up to sure. that. Sure. I mean, okay, so I understand what both of you are saying on this. The mom and pops definitely is something that we want to, want to do well. But why is this business different than any other business that other businesses have to be open or have the option of being open on Sundays? And there's mom and pop organizations involved in other businesses where, in this business, we're protecting just mom and pops in this case. Mr. Heisman, let's start with you on that. Sure. Uh, I think the, the, the difference is, is what John just uh, referenced. What are our constituents asking for? What are uh, the people of this district saying, and the folks that are running these small shops? Maybe the issue on the border is a different issue. Maybe, maybe the reason that you see uh, people going across the border uh, isn't just because it's Sunday. Maybe it's because there's a difference in taxes. Maybe they're saving some money on those bottles when they drive a few miles extra. Uh, so I think that my concern is is primarily going to be with my district and what are the what are the people here uh, telling me? Okay, thank you, Mr. Ward. And now, um, now I'm glad I did use that story because you know, um, you know, it, to me it, it also uh, reflects, uh, you know, why do auto stores, automobile sales want to be shut? Why do uh, big 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 uh, lots and small lots? Why do RV places want to be shut and oftentimes what I hear um, is that uh, this is our only day to spend with our family um, and so you know um, I don't know if that's the case with uh, smaller mom and pop shops as well uh, liquor stores as well um, but I just have a sense that they too um, sense that you know they're going to put in uh, extra staff extra hours uh, you know extra extra expenses um, and not recover uh, the revenue that it's going to cost them to be open. It's going to be a, it's going to be a losing prof, prof, uh, 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 example for them. All right, thank you. Our next question will come from Ms. Holton and will be directed towards Mr. Ward first. Right now, Minnesota depends on coal, oil, gas, and uranium from other states and nations for most of our energy. What's your vision for Minnesota's long-term energy needs and do you see any potential sources for energy production? Well, hey, thank you again for that question. And, um, you know, number one, I want to just say that, you know, we need, a, we're going to need a balanced approach to our energy resources, our energy sources. Um, the in industries of uh, the wood pulp industries, uh, paper making industries, the lumbering industries, the mining industries, they certainly are going to need um, fossil fuels, uh, coal based, uh, um, base load, uh, the cleanest that it possibly can be delivered to them uh, to run. Um, however, uh, I am a real supporter of renewable energies, bio, wind, solar, uh, all of the renewables that we uh, have available to us. In 2007, um, I was proud to join many of my colleagues in the state legislature in passing the, the nation-leading uh, renewable, renewable energy standard, you know, for the nation. 25% of our energy costs need to be renewable by the year 2025. Very proud of that. And, in fact, I also applaud and appreciate the fact that most utilities are getting close to meeting that standard. Um, you know, that says that there is, in fact, a, uh, a need and a uh, uh, demand uh, for uh, renewables, um, whether it be bio, wind, solar. Last year in the state legislature, we passed a solar energy uh, standard uh, that was top shelf in the nation as well. I was just attended a, a, a Camp Ripley a project that's going to be nation leading solar farm at Camp Ripley. Huge number of solar panels. You know, right here in central Minnesota, we have real. 
Uh, we have a hunt technology. We had uh, a silent power. Uh, we have win uh, we have Winkleman Wind. We have a re we're Silicon Valley for renewable energies here. I, I need to stop. I'm sorry, Mr. Heinzman. Uh, by the way, there will not be a rebuttal on this because we are running out of time. So, Mr. Heisman, you have your two minutes, and we'll close. Across the state, people are seeing energy costs go up. Businesses are seeing energy costs go up. And I have people that have been asking me as I'm going door to door, why is that happening? Why do I see my prices continuing to rise, rise, rise? Well, a big part of that reason is because we continue to pass legislation that is forcing an industry to use um, sources for power that cost more money. And the people in Minnesota need to, have, uh, need to have a clear understanding of the impact uh, of those, those uh, rules changes. Uh, in Minnesota, we are scheduled to continue to require the energy industry to uh, expand the use of renewables. Uh, this is going to continue to force prices to go up. Uh, some people don't know this, but we uh, in Minnesota are under a moratorium of a sort. We cannot build a new clean coal facility. We cannot, clean, we cannot build another uh, nuclear power plant, regardless of how the technology might have changed since, since the uh, original construction of those buildings. And so I think that we need to have a, a balanced approach. That's fine. But it's got to be feasible. It's got to be able to keep costs either stable or dropping Let's look for opportunities to drop the cost of power. That base load that we're talking about, that's the power that you have to have there when everybody turns the lights on in the morning. You have to have a significant source of power, and wind and solar are not there yet. Maybe in 50 years, maybe in 20 years, who knows? But right now, if we're going to go ahead and we're going to address those issues, we need to address them in a way that reduces costs and finds ways for businesses and individuals to keep those prices low. There's a lot of folks on fixed incomes. There's a lot of people that are feeling the pinch in this economy. And this is, this is, a, this is a critical issue to our state, and this is a big decision that needs to be addressed in the future going forward. All right, thank you. That brings us to the closure and to the concluding comments from each of you. You each have two minutes. We'll start with Mr. Heinzman. I would just like to thank, I'd like to thank you all again for the opportunity uh, to be here tonight. I am a man of faith, I'm a husband, I'm a father, and I'm a businessman. Unfortunately, over the past few years, Representative Ward has voted against our district's values. We raised taxes by $2.1 billion. We too quickly forced an incomplete, shaky health care law on the Minnesotans. We spent more for an office building for legislators than we did for our roads and bridge projects throughout the state. We also redefined marriage. These are not issues of conscience. These are examples of St. Paul forcing its will on us with the assistance of our representatives. My closets are full of the clothing of a blue collar worker. And I understand what it means to live and work in the Lakes area. This November, we have a perfect opportunity to set a new course in Minnesota. I will make your values my priority, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Thank you, Mr. Heinzman. Mr. Ward. Well, thank you again for uh, uh, putting this together, everybody that's involved, and for those that are watching. Um, you know, um, I'm going to talk about endorsements, and it kind of leads right from what uh, my opponent said. Um, you know, um, endorsements are an important part of a campaign process. Uh, m many candidates... Uh, seek endorsements by the organizations that they believe uh, they, work f they work with and they represent their values and their principles as well. Um, I am, you know, you, endorsements aren't automatic. Some people say they just go to the incumbent. That is not absolutely the case. Uh, to get an endorsement, you need to uh, fill out a candidate questionnaire, and, uh, and then those people, that organization, looks at uh, how you match up with their philosophies, their ideologies, and their principles. Uh, you also, if you have a voting record, uh, they look at that to see if, in fact, you uh, match with uh, the qualities that they want. Uh, you know, and so I would like to share a few of my endorsements. Uh, I'm endorsed by multiple uh, education groups for my support of public education. I'm the MCCL, Minnesota Citizens Concerned for Life, pro-life endorsed candidate for my pro-life stance the last eight years. 
I am labor endorsed for my passion and my uh, uh, fighting for the labor movement. I am also the NRA endorsed candidate, the National Rifle Association, and the Gun Owners Civil Rights uh, Alliance endorsed candidate for my strong Second Amendment right support uh, over the last eight years. The CARE PAC, the nursing homes, and the group home workers uh, also have endorsed me for my work with them. I have received multiple environmental conservation uh, endorsements uh, for my work with the environment and conservation and energy. Uh, so, you know, as a can, and you can see all of my endorsements at my website, www.voteforward or voteforward.net. Um, and, you know, um, I think Arnie Carlson said it best. We need to send the brightest and the best to the state. And, um, and I believe that's me, and I ask for your endorsement, your support, and your vote on November. Thank you. Thank you both for taking time out to share your views with our viewers this evening. That concludes our debate for this, this evening. And if you or anyone in your family or friends have missed some of this or all of it, uh, in 24 hours this will be posted on the Lakeland Public Television website, lptv.org. Or tomorrow you can get a recap at the Brainerd Dispatch, or you can also go to the Brainerd Dispatch website, which is brainerddispatch.com. That's one word. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good evening.